Hello, and welcome to session three in our Cybersecurity for Industrial Systems Roundtable series, sponsored by Rockwell Automation. My name is Katie, and I will be your Global Spec Moderator, and I would like to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the operation of the user interface for today's webinar. A large window with the heading Presentation in the upper left is the primary window for today's webinar. Just to the right of the main presentation window is the speaker bio window with background information on today's presenters. Just below that is the Q&A window. At any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the box in the lower section of the window and click Submit. Your question will be placed in the queue to address when we get to the Q&A session. At the bottom of your screen, you will see additional buttons to enhance your webinar experience. To see what a particular button does, just place your mouse pointer over it and a tooltip will appear with a description of the button's function. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for the Cybersecurity for Industrial Systems Roundtable series, Edgar Sauter. Edgar is the Senior Director of New Product Technology at CSA Group. Edgar and his team looked at the technology horizon for new developments and applications that could present opportunities for CSA's test, inspection, and certification business. To read more about Edgar or any of our participants today, please look at the speaker bio window right next to the main presentation window. And with that, I would like to pass things along to Edgar to lead us through today's discussion on protecting industry and infrastructure from advanced persistent threats. So Edgar, welcome to today's event. Thank you, Katie, for the introduction. I am Edgar Soter, Senior Director of New Product Technology for CAC Group, and I will be the moderator of this round uh, table. We are so pleased that you could join us today as we put together this excellent group of experts in uh, infrastructure and industrial security to discuss how to identify and surpass common cyber threats. With us today, we have Eduardo Di Monti, who is a cybersecurity strategic growth leader at Rockwell Automation. He has more than 10 years of experience focused on automation and industrial control systems. We have a Siam and Madanapali. Siam chairs the IEEE Committee P2994, which is responsible for creating a standard framework for IoT security assessment. This framework covers end devices and up to the edge of the IoT applications with considerations from the end-to-end -end IoT applications deployment. We have a David Tujuri. So David has spent 20 years developing cybersecurity solutions in the Israeli defense industry. He has 30 years of experience as a software developer, system engineer, and a system architect. And now he's pursuing a PhD in network and system risk assessment. We have Seth Lessie. He brings 12 years of experience in government and commercial threat hunting, adversary tactics, and OT industrial defense. He's an Offensive Security Certified Professional and a GIAC Certified Penetration Tester. And last but not least, Rick Peters. Rick brings 37 years of distinguished cybersecurity experience to the table. He has held various leadership and engineering roles for the U.S. National Security Agency, and today he is the CISO of Operational Technology for Fortinet. So Eduardo, Sia, David, Seth, and Rick, thank you very much for joining us today and share your knowledge and experience with the audience. Increasingly, infrastructure and industry are at risk of high-tech and well-organized cyber threats. Sometimes this comes from hacker collectives, business competitors, or foreign governments. No matter where these attacks come from, the intent is always the same disable key infrastructure and manufacturing to disrupt normal life. So as more machines, equipment, and instructors appear on digital networks, protecting those assets has never been more important for us. So today our panelists will offer ideas about what this takes based on their wealth of experience. But before we begin, let's take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors for today. So Rockwell Automation is a global leader in industrial automation and digital transformation solutions. Rockwell's domain expertise in operational technology and industrial environments afford Rockwell the opportunity to advise companies in their OT cybersecurity strategy, strategy and be a supplier uh, of industrial automation cybersecurity services and solutions. 
For more information, visit uh, roadblockautomation.com. This webinar is hosted by Global Spec, the world's largest online industrial destination for product sourcing and engineering information. So without further delay, let's start with our panel today. And I want to start with something as simple, just for the benefit of the people that um, may not know about this topic too much and are listening about this topic for the first time. Let's just start by defining what are advanced persistent threats. So I ask the question to the group. So I take this, this question. Uh, advanced uh, persistent uh, threats or APTs are threats that are not detected by existing uh, security tools like firewalls, IPS, IPS. Uh, but most of them uh, use uh, the same steps uh, that we can call a cyber kill chain. Uh, they need to penetrate a, a network, uh, initial access, lateral movement, hoping between the nodes, uh, privilege escalation, gaining uh, admin access, command and control, uh, which means communicating with the attacker, and the exfiltration that the uh, malware uh, will send the found information to the attacker. Usually, these kind of uh, threats use uh, zero days, which are vulnerability, vulnerabilities that are not yet published. Well, you know, I just want to add to that and say David gave a fantastic textbook coverage for what we talk about when we think about advanced persistent threat. But uh, I like to think about these campaigns ultimately as gaining access, gaining access to systems and being able to create doubt, doubt within the community, doubt with the customers, doubt with the system owners, right? And then the, per- the ability to prevail on target, of course, is the use of techniques that fall into the gamut of APT. But I think ultimately it's all about figuring out how to one, detect and be able to neutralize these kinds of activities before they become problematic to the point where they cause uh, a wider scale impact and and social uh, issues that uh, quickly grow and manifest today because of course uh, our community writ large globally is always consuming intelligence. Thank you, David and Rick. Now, to the audience, you may see here a lot two uh, specific scenarios uh, where we uh, unfold this topic. You will hear uh, information technology and operation technology. Can any of the panelists please quickly define the difference between these two? Yeah, absolutely. I'll be happy to hop in on this one. Um, you know, when we're talking about IT networks, we're talking about the networks that handle kind of your traditional business functions. So email, messaging, your databases, your website. Um, whereas when we're talking about operational technology, uh, at Drago's, we like to talk about it as the place where cyber meets physics, right? So these are networks that have a physical effect. They're managing physical operations. And so their failure or attacks on them have a physical effect within the real world. Good. Sian, did you have also a, a comment on that? Yeah, I just want to expand on that. Um, so uh, in the OT, typically consists of you know, uh, mission-to-mission connectivity or people-to-mission connectivity typically involves in controlling the physical world or your physical process, right? Whereas in the IT world, it is more of communicating between the people uh, for information dissemination and collaboration, so this actually brings a, a critical difference um, in these networks. In the OT networks, high availability is very important. I mean, whereas in the um, uh, IT networks, you can afford the downtime, but confidentiality probably is more important. These things actually have some implications towards the how we secure these networks. Understood. I think to that from, from the technical aspect, uh, in the IT, uh, the protocols used are the common uh, usual uh, communications one like TCP IP, HTTP, FTP. And uh, usually in the OT, communications are uh, more proprietary uh, for the sensors and the product user. I'm just going to add one comment to this, Edgar, and I, and I think it's sort of complementary to everything we've already heard. And that is when you think about operational technology, whether you're talking about energy, manufacturing, transportation, it's very cross-cutting, right? The one abiding principle, business principle, is safe and continuous operations. You cannot be able or have to incur a a latency as a result of trying to layer security into the environment. So your OT leaders and operators are very sensitive to that. So safe and continuous operations is always the abiding driving principle underneath it all. Perfect. Thank you very much for that uh, interesting definition and for clarifying the difference. Now, let's start talking about those uh, advanced persistent threats. And Eduardo, this question is for you. Uh, What are those 
common threats that you can find and how they are different from other type of cyber threats? Yeah, so I mean, APT threat, we tend to think that, that normally we're, uh, we will never be affected by those types of threats, but, but in reality, everybody uh, can, can have those type of threats on their system, right? And, and, and if we link this with what we commented about IT and OT, it's, uh, it's about the impact, right? How, how is going to react the, the business if you have this type of threat inside the company? Then APT are, are much more difficult to detect, right? As, 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 as we've seen in the definition, right? It's not simple to detect. So you need to do investments in detection and also in reaction and of course in recovery, right? So, um, that, that, that would be the idea. Got it. Perfect. Now, and what are those um, kind of strategies that you follow um, to detect those, those, those threats? Like, uh, David, that probably this question is for you. Uh, I heard something about the static and dynamic um, um, analysis, network analysis. Could you please elaborate on that? Yes, sure. Uh, the static network analysis enables us uh, to search for uh, known uh, unpatched uh, vulnerabilities and misconfiguration that can be used uh, by attackers. Um, and uh, to this, um, uh, to do this efficiency, we need two things. Uh, one is the topology of the network, the list of uh, the nodes and the software installed uh, uh, on them. And for this, we can uh, uh, use the uh, uh, scanning tools. And we also need the list of known uh, vulnerabilities uh, that uh, can be retrieved from uh, known uh, public access. Uh, but another source for uh, the known vulnerabilities is the threat intelligence reports that an, uh, the expert uh, analysts have uh, analyzed uh, the published uh, attacks. And they mention they use techniques, vulnerabilities, etc., that can be used in our uh, organization to be, be uh, better prepared. For dynamic uh, network uh, analysis, uh, we should continuously uh, collect the events and the logs from the nodes and from uh, the security tools, analyze them, uh, and detect um, uh, possible uh, attacks. Here, the problem is the huge uh, number of uh, events. How can we find suspicious activities in thousands and sometimes millions of events that can be in, in, large, uh, in large networks? So we can use uh, the threat intelligence uh, to learn the attacker's intentions and the tools and the methods that they, they use. So this, in this way, we can focus on what is relevant to uh, our organization. In addition, when uh, we look at uh, the CTI and we have the events, we can validate if uh, those events are relevant to our organization. And in this way, we can uh, filter the huge amount, uh, amount of data. And in addition, uh, we can use um, uh, uh, machine learning and uh, other uh, um, uh, possible things for uh, this big data, but we'll be elaborate on this later. Thank you, David. Now, when it comes to comparing I, uh, IT and, and OT, like you guys make a, a really great definition of the difference between them. I bet there are specific challenges for each of these environments. Um, well, they have different type of equipments. They have, you mentioned, they have different type of, uh, they use different type of protocols. So can you elaborate a little bit on what those specific challenges for one and the other one? So probably I'll take that uh, first. I think one of the major challenges you know, uh, in the OT networks is the lack of asset details. So when I say asset details, it's not just about the name of the asset and where it is located, rather having information about the risk profiles associated with those assets. That is one of the major issue in the OT networks. The second uh, issue is it, typically for IT networks, there are vendors and third parties. There are lots of you know, companies who publish the uh, vulnerability information and how to patch them. So for OT networks, you don't have that luxury, right? The other important thing is that you know, typically the uh, operations, operational uh, shop floors and some of those uh, actual facilities we don't employ full-time employees for security threat monitoring. That's another issue. So they need to typically um, allocate budget for hiring security professionals. Probably that's not happening. 
The other important thing is that you know, in OT networks, you have to deal with the legacy systems that are actually deployed decades ago, right? So how do we kind of you know, cope up with current trades is another challenge, right? And, and most importantly, I mean, any security uh, breaches in the OT networks impacts the, the physical world or the safety of the people, Right. So these are some of the challenges that make OT networks, um, securing the OT networks is uh, very different from the IT networks. I'd like to add on to that just a little, Edgar. And, and boy, Simon, sure. yeah, was, Simon spot on and just add to it and saying what is really distinguishing when you start to contrast the two environments is the techniques that are available to you in your IT toolkit to be very careful in the operational technology space. Not only are you dealing with the legacy technology, hardware and software that Sian mentioned, but you're dealing with, with systems and environments and, and technologies that are fragile. When you start touching PLCs and RTUs, uh, you find out really quickly those active techniques of scanning don't work. In fact, you'll create enemies really fast because you'll knock those systems over. So we, you know, we recognize that going in and that's part of building uh, that cybersecurity maturity into the operational technology spaces recognizing those unique approaches and then calibrating how we protect the environment. That's good, Rick. Now, staying there, like, I just have a question for you. How can um, we learn from, from previous um, cyber attacks, including uh, uh, APTs, on how to proactively basically have an approach for risk mitigation in the future? That's an excellent question. You know, we certainly know that and have paid attention over the last few years, and, and not just because we had a global pandemic. Certainly that amplified a lot of things. Innovation moved very quickly uh, out of the gate in 2020. But what, what, what you can pay attention to is that, you know, these unethical cyber hackers, bad, bad actors, however you want to characterize them, they certainly amplify their disruptive campaigns and frequencies go up during periods that are considered opportune. So when you're introducing new tech, technologies and innovating, extending the work environment. Operational technology didn't get a free pass when we had to figure out how to work from home. Across all of those environments, we had to be able to figure it out. And of course, that introduced uh, opportunity, not just because we have legacy technology, but because of course that expanded the attack surface. And again, these these activities are gonna, are gonna persist because they're, they're, they're unselfish. And also there's a lot of greed in, involved in these activities because they can profit from gaining access and being able to showcase their tradecraft to not just uh, get onto target, but to exfiltrate intellectual property, to steal those assets, your crown jewels, the data that separates you from your competition, because that's valuable on the open market, as is privacy data. There's just a wealth of intelligence out there available to them. And so that presents a problem to us. And we have to recognize that it's going to persist and that reuse of technologies and tradecraft that maybe we haven't seen in a while in the IT world work very well in an exposed attack surface that is characterized in operational technology. Understood. Now, Eduardo, I have a question for you because uh, David mentioned probably some of the of the approaches uh, to kind of uh, detect these, these threats. But what are the techniques that, that uh, can be used to mitigate those risks? Of the so, yeah, yeah. The, the, the idea in order to mitigate is to have the right balance, right? In the investment in, in, in many pillars, right? One would be, of course, uh, discovering your assets. Another one is detecting. Another one is response, recovery and protection, right? We could, we could all agree that based on those five uh, major activities, uh, the, the main things that a, um, a, a client or, or an organization should do in order to lower the risk because we cannot, you know, uh, kill it, right? <laughs> so basically, the idea, in my opinion, is this: we need the right balance because if we do a lot of investment just in protecting, we're not going to be too responsive. If we do a lot of response, we're not protecting, right? So the challenge here is about two things. What is the right balance of those five things or five activities and also timing? Because if it takes two years to deploy, you know, the technology to actually detect then those two years, we have a high level of risk. So that's the challenge that the CISOs have, right? And we as a service provider, we need to support them and assess them to, to, to manage that challenge. Yeah. Understood. Now, a question for, for you, Seth. 
how does data add uh, to to these uh, techniques? Yeah, so you know, one thing that's come up as we've talked about uh, advanced persistent threats or APTs is that you're often dealing with an adversary who's focused on stealth and uh, is very motivated to hide their activities. So this means that regardless of the specific tactics, techniques, and procedures or TTPs that they're deploying in the environment, um, it will be inherently less noisy and, and harder to find. So this is going to result in fewer opportunities for detection relative to an unsophisticated and less disciplined criminal adversary. So the where data comes in is that you know, the more data sources you can draw on when hunting for these APT threats and the more logging you undertake, you're going to up your chances of being able to observe the adversary behavior um, from at least one angle, disrupt it, and then potentially pivot to other aspects of the adversary's infrastructure and targeting. Perfect. Now, all these, of course, requires decision making. Like the organization who that is implemented will have to make the right decisions to get the right approach. So this is a question probably for Siam. Like you have dealt with this, this situation. How critical is it for executive and business leaders to understand these threats? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's actually very critical, uh, very critical because it will have lots of impact on the business. And of course, sometimes it might affect the people lives. So uh, w- one of the key differences, you know, uh, f- for APT versus, you know, typical other hacker come and take whatever is available right now and go. In APT, their intention is come and live within the network and search for critical information, right? So detecting, uh, you know, uh, APT is, uh, is a kind of cumbersome. In my opinion, it requires you know, continuous monitoring and they require a full-time security personnel uh, doing the work all, all the day and every day. Right? So which requires you know, kind of you know, budgets available so that you know, they can hire the security professionals. So obviously this requires you know, a senior executives decision to allocate the budget. That's the first thing. Right? The other important thing uh, is, you know, the approach to uh, cybersecurity in the OT networks. So especially to prevent APT, you need a zero trust security implementation on it, which means make sure that you know, every asset is pro- protected and you know, every user is suspected. So that you know, to make sure that you know, even somebody um, get into the uh, OT network, but they will not be able to get access to the critical uh, components within the network, right? The other important aspect is that, you know, for an APT, the initial vulnerability may be through an employee, right? Uh, so most of the staff within the OT networks, they're computer illiterate. So training them, bringing the awareness is an other important aspect, Right which requires you know, uh, senior executives decision making to develop the policies and procedures for this, right? In my opinion, there is another important thing you know, that these uh, senior executives can make, try to converge the OT and IT networks and also the staff so that you can actually bring you know, best of the both the worlds uh, and then you can actually secure uh, their IT and OT networks better and in this process, they can also reduce the cost because they are going to utilize the staff between the uh, two domains. I think these are some of the key aspects wherein the uh, senior executives can play a role. Good. And now, and how, how like these personnel can, can learn more about these threats as, as they go against the security personnel? And you mentioned something interesting because many of the stakeholders here they may not have a training in software. They are electrical engineers. They, they work, they work in the, in the uh, uh, operation technology. So how can they keep those skills sharp? Yeah. So, um, so first thing is, you know, uh, the risks are evolving, right? So that is something, you know, an awareness as a uh, company they should bring uh, to the staff, right? And of course, the, the complexity is also increasing. And so uh, people have to learn about the complexity uh, that is coming within the OT network. 
and there are uh, no uh, best uh, no, no proven practices available elsewhere i think there is a, some kind of collaboration is required among the uh, companies to bring those best practices so that you know the people or uh, the staff can learn about these things right and of course the standards are something they should also evolve you know due to the uh, evolving risks and increasing complexity of the networks but in my opinion all these things would happen but what is probably uh, more important is you know uh, providing training to more people who can actually play the uh, uh, security roles within the ot networks i think for me at this time the initial of quality i mean quantity of these people is actually more important so that you know they can actually play day to day activities so that you know once there is a uh, any threat detection they can always bring in the appropriate security professionals to fix that so i think you know um, companies have to balance you know in terms of you know uh, improving the uh skills of the existing staff at the same time training the more people actually who can actually help in detecting the security threats perfect it's, thank it's, you it's, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I'd, li- i'd like to pile on to what siam just shared because it's it's so important right in 2022 that we're focusing on a pivot a pivot of having our workforce be an asset instead of a liability which is exactly what he was talking about but i think the responsibility is all of ours you know you've got a collective of subject matter experts here today uh we're all in it to win it and i think today partnerships more important than ever and i think industry is challenged to lean into it harder and share uh giving away educational opportunities is more important than it ever but we always talk about threat intelligence sharing and information sharing and and today industry uh have to lean into it and give their curriculum away. We've been doing that at Fortinet now for a couple of years. It does pay dividends because it the the table stakes are high. And so the, in order to counter that, we have to be able to raise the knowledge base. And by working together collaboratively, I think we can accomplish that objective. Yeah, thank you Rick. Yeah, go ahead Sam. Oh, absolutely. I cannot agree more on that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So 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 far we have a uh, seen the weather uh um, advanced persistent threats and where they impact more, most of an organization. So let's try to dive in more into the strategies themselves. Now that we have made the definition, we have uh, have some main concepts clear. And Seth, I want to start with with you. Uh, I think in a, in a previous conversation you mentioned something about focusing on uh, adversary tactics, techniques and procedure and mentioning that that's probably a, a, the best strategy. Uh, could you please elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of in our our definition of APTs, one thing we talked about is that um they're using uh zero days and exploits that might not have been seen before, vulnerabilities that might not have been seen before. And so um you know, when we we talk about kind of traditional detection methodologies, things like IOCs, you know, these have utility, but relying on them as a sole source to drive threat hunting direction kind of leaves you perpetually behind these advanced adversaries evolution and and their changing targeting. So, you know, a lot of this ultimately derives from the fact that you know, infrastructure, so uh the resources the adversary is using to to launch these campaigns is really easy to churn. Um but behaviors are not. Uh so you know the way the adversary goes about um attacking the network it is going to be consistent even if the individual capabilities that they're using uh changes. And so that's not to suggest that things like IOCs don't have a role to play um but they really have a defined shelf life. And so looking to how these adversaries behave whenever they get inside a network um allows you to conduct hunts and build detection methodologies that are uh proactive instead of reactive right you're you're not um reacting to information that's already been published so the techniques that the adversary was using yesterday you're thinking about how the adversary um behaves within a network environment and therefore um you know that methodology of detection is going to have uh, a much longer uh, shelf life and be more effective in um countering these these really sophisticated and stealthy threats. Yeah, thank you so David, I think you may have an input here uh on the role of machine learning uh for situations like this and I don't know if it has anything to do with with set has but if you can wanted to span in some other application of machine learning when it comes to uh, APTs. 
Yeah, sure. Um, as I mentioned before, cyber attacks have many uh, many steps, uh, initial access, lateral movement, etc. And using uh, vulnerabilities, misconfiguration, uh, and sometimes zero, zero days. But if it's a zero, zero day and the vulnerability is not uh, familiar and the existing tool cannot detect it, how can uh, we uh, detect uh, such uh, such kind of kind of threat? So we can use um, machine learning to uh, learn the baseline of uh, network uh, behavior. And then we can identify anomalies to that, to that uh, baseline. And this may uh, imply uh, such uh, cyber attacks. In addition, in an uh, ICS environment, that we have many events, we have many sensors, and many uh, other machines that are gener generating uh, logs and events. Uh, we can use um, machine learning to analyze uh, this uh, big data pool, classify uh, the, the data, uh, colorate different uh, parameters, and there we can identify patterns that also may imply uh, cyber attacks. Thank you, David. Now, following in, the, in that track, um, Rick, I think you mentioned in our convers previous conversation also about uh, behavioral analytics, focus on um, on le uh, legacy technology and technology that already exists. Um, is that something that can be used even with the technology that is already in place in OT, which is very common? It, like, as you said, there are many PLCs, there are many RTUs existing there. Can we still apply those techniques? Edgar, that's a terrific question. And I think it's poignant, right? It helps us recognize that across the stack, you can characterize what looks like normal. And I think within, if we think from the inside out, which is kind of pivoting, right? We always, of course, are worried about the edges, but we have to understand behaviorally what's going on across that OT stack and being able to not just characterize it, but continually learn and, and capture that. You hear technologies or techniques like artificial intelligence and and machine learning today is being put into play, right? Because it's the power of handling data. Data is the commodity of interest. It's the commodity of interest by the enterprise, right? To be able to accomplish business more efficiently and effectively, which has driven this connectivity, otherwise characterized as convergence in the first place. So if we think about that challenge, now it's about applying what we already know how to do very well. Role-based access says, yeah, I, I know that... Uh, Seth, I'll use him as an example, is, has access to this particular platform. I know what his behavior looks like. If he starts to exhibit something that's unusual, I need to pay attention to that. It may be malicious, it may not, but I have to be able to tune into that. So I use those behavior analytics to recognize something that's changed and then do that analysis in a very timely fashion because I have to be able to do all of this within the business cycle. But as of course, we already talked about the absolution of being safe and sustaining those operations and we cannot slow it down. Perfect. Thank you, Rick. Now, there was a term that caught my attention when we were uh, discussing this topic before. Living of the land techniques. What is that? Uh, and Seth, I think it came in our conversation with you. Is that something that you can explain a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this kind of um, comes back to something we've talked about with um, these more advanced adversaries and their, their desire for stealth, right? So when we're talking about living off the land techniques, uh, we're describing the adversary practice of using native system tools and binaries to accomplish their malicious intent. Um, so while historically we'd seen this mainly in the realm of post-exploitation um, with system tools like PS exec or WIMIC, um, with the abuse of low bins or living off the land binaries, uh, such as MSI exec and Red Server 32 to proxy the execution of malicious code, um, we can now see this, uh, tactic across the, the kill chain that, uh, David ex uh, explained earlier. And so, since the adversary is abusing legitimate system components rather than uh, trying to um, rather than trying to execute unsigned malicious code or download their own tooling, it can make it significantly more difficult to detect. Um, and so now I kind of want to bring this back to something that David and, and Rick were talking about, which is the key here is having a good network baseline and an understanding of what is normal for users in your environment so that you can hunt for this anomalous user behavior, even when this behavior is executed um, using legitimate network tools. Um, and I think that that 
highlights another uh, interesting thing that, that Rick touched on, which is just the importance of visibility and an ability to log within um, an ICS environment and some of the inherent challenges that that brings in when you're dealing with this legacy equipment and some of these unique protocols. And so, you know, combating these techniques in a traditional enterprise IT environment is difficult, but when you add in the difficulty of uh, effective logging and data collection um, within an OT environment, um, it, it just ups the both the threat and the difficulty of detection even more. Now, this is interesting. From personal experience, I remember having to deal with devices that were in the field, very low bandwidth to reach to them. And also, sometimes they even have to connect to third-party applications outside of the LT network where they were. What is the right approach to deal with those type of situations? That question probably go to Seth or, or, or Rick, uh, depending yeah. on your experience. Yeah, I, I can I can go ahead and and, and jump in here. I, I mean, I think it comes back to something we we've touched on several times, which is that uh, availability and continuity of operations needs to be your your primary concern. So um, when you're you're dealing with particularly low bandwidth, low compute, um, you you need to consider what the effect of any uh, solution that you're going to be put in place is on the operation of that device because. Um, if your monitoring solution or or if your security solution uh, renders that device inoperable, then then the medicine is worse than the cure, essentially. And so um, your primary concern needs to be availability. And so if if there are issues with being able to actively monitor that device, then you need to acknowledge it as as a new risk service, right? And so if you can't monitor on the device itself remotely, you need to understand that that's a potential path into your network. And so that ingress needs to be monitored as opposed to the specific device if that device can't be monitored without impacting availability. Got right, it. Seth, Thank you. Yeah, that's all over it, Edgar. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that's also a reality about operational technology is, is the, you're not talking about close on-prem all the time. It's a very distributed environment. Uh, many opportunities, right, to have to address protection of assets that are remote. And so bandwidth, obviously, is always a consideration. But again, as, as Seth pointed out, it, it, it highlights when you're doing consequence engineering and analysis and risk analysis, vulnerability analysis, it's recognizing all the flavors of what that needs. So a close access attack on a, on a remote asset might work for quite well if you're not able to somehow understand what's changing state-wise that requires immediate attention. Perfect. Thank you, Seth and Rick. Now, we have talked about um, kind of the prediction, the detection, the analysis. What about uh, what can be learned once an attack has occurred? What is called a, a post-attack forensics? Uh, David, I have a note here that you mentioned that in our previous conversation. So is that something that we could also leverage uh, in the approach that we have for a, a, a advanced persistent threats? Yes, absolutely. Um, as you invest more uh, in protecting the network, uh, you reduce the chances to be penetrated and infected. But, you know, cyber attacks uh, may still happen. But after an attack uh, happens... It, uh, it's important to understand how it happened, uh, where it hit, and what are the damages. How it uh, happened uh, for uh, improving the defense, uh, closing the holes, and uh, be better prepared for the next time. Where it hit, so we can clean the, the area and remove uh, the bundle. And what are the damages? It's uh, to, to prepare uh, the recovery uh, phase. To perform these uh, steps, uh, you need uh, some, some tool. Uh, you, you can use a good manual forensic tool with an expert that knows how to uh, use it and a lot of patience uh, until uh, the forensic analysis is done. A better way uh, may be using an advanced forensic tool uh, that automatically collects uh, the data from uh, the media that is uh, suspicious to be uh, infected and uh, runs different static and uh, dynamic analysis uh, according to the file types and the, the detected, uh, detected uh, threats, and generates any uh, report that uh, any cyber admin uh, can understand, including some recommendation for recovery steps. Thank you, David. Uh, now, Siam, oh, a question for you, because we, when we introduced you, we uh, 
highlight that you are the chair of the uh, IGP committee uh, P2994. Uh, and this is a very relevant um, standard for, for this topic that we are talking about. Could you please explain a little bit what are the um, uh, provisions that the standard is, is uh, putting there to help in, in this type of attack? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, for uh, uh, what is security? I mean, uh, there are several standards exist already, right? So we are not developing, you know, to replace anything new, I mean, right? NIST has framework for uh, control system cybersecurity, and there is the IEC 62443. Uh, I mean, and also GSM Association is developing, you know, uh, some standard. There is the IoT Security Foundation, and Etsy is developing the uh, some guidelines for consumer devices. So, however, um, we think that you know the the risks are increasing, and the number of hackers are increasing. And complexity in the hyper-connected world is increasing. I think we actually need more innovation and more standards so that you know we can actually train uh, more people for uh, security function, right? So we want to kind of you know innovate at IEEE P two nine nine four to simplify the security assessment for Internet of Things, right? So one of the simplifications that we want to do is in IoT or in OT, you have a you know, variety of devices. All of them are constrained devices. Some of them are operating in the difficult environments. They don't have input output devices. They have limited processing power, variety of protocols, I mean, right? So how do we assess uh, given these mixture of these devices and protocols, right? We want to kind of you know, simplify that aspect. The other aspect that we want to simplify is how does a business leader in OT environment understand what kind of you know, risk profile that OT environment is operating? So how do I present the assessment information to them? Right. So one of the uh, uh, approach we are taking is, can I grade the, my OT network on every day or every time or every minute? What is their risk? I mean, can I kind of color code and give some kind of, you know, a KPI visible for all the stakeholders so that they are aware of what's going on, what they need to do, right? So these are some of the things that we are working on. So we just started, uh, I hope, you know, uh, we will come up with a good standard uh, looking for you know, uh, collaborating with the industry and other individuals who are interested in this. Well, you may have candidates here to help you on the standards. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Siam. This is an, a great topic. We have had so far a great discussion, great comments from, from all of you. Unfortunately, we are constrained by time today and uh, the, we have reached uh, the time for, for the panel. Uh, but we have so, uh, some questions from the audience as, as we were having the, the discussion. So why don't we pass it to Katie and, and then we'll jump uh, back to talk about the, some of the questions that have come from, from our audience today. So back to you, Katie. Gentlemen, thank you all so much for that great presentation. As Edgar mentioned, we are going to move into answering some questions right now. If you have a question for us today, please go ahead and enter it into the Q&A window and hit submit. We will get to as many questions as we can today. If we do not have time for your question today, do not worry. We will reach out to you following today's session. So, Edgar, I'm going to pass it back to you and the group to answer some of our attendees' questions. Well, thank you, Katie. And we have some questions from our audience. Uh, can I start actually with them? So, this first question, um, I believe, goes to uh, Eduardo. It fits your, your uh, area of expertise, Eduardo. So, the question is, um, how do you think automation can protect against the typical uh, APT threats, APT attacks? I think OT vendors uh, like us, Rob, well, we can we can help including the cybersecurity from the design of the phase, right? So the idea is that we can do an end-to-end -end process, right? So we can do the design, we can do the assessment, we can do the implementation, and along those different phases we include the different activities related to cybersecurity. So, so we take in consideration not only the availability, but also the, the protection and the resilience of the entire uh, 
OT uh, infrastructure. That's how we can help you. And of course, also collaborating and helping the the other companies and doing partnerships with different brands. That that would be the strategy. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Thank you. The other the other question we have here, uh, I think it goes to to UCM. So it says cyber analysts are expensive and rare, but the need of them is growing. How can we handle more cyber events, but with the same number of analysts? It's very interesting. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Uh, in fact, we touched based on this you know, during our discussion. I'll quickly summarize here, right? The, the number of risks are increasing, I mean, right? Uh, and the complexity of the networks are increasing. And of course, making the security more complex and you know, more expensive, um, there are a couple of things you know, that the industry has to do. I mean, right? One is the industry has to collaborate and share uh, the proven best practices right? so that the knowledge can be given to the uh, security professionals. Right? That's one important thing. The other important thing is that we need more professionals. There is no shortcut for that. So we need to simplify the uh, security functions and we need to train more people, I mean, right? More engineers, I mean, who can actually uh, uh, put into work on day-to-day -day basis, right? This is an important thing that industry has to look into, right? And the other thing, I am looking for more innovation in terms of you know, data-driven tools that they can deploy so that you know, they can assist these security professionals on their day-to-day -day jobs so that you know, detecting APTs actually will become uh, much easier. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Siam. Thank you. The third question we have, um, I believe you can go to you, Rick. It says, previously, uh, breaching a network boundary provided a path for an attacker to move laterally within a network. Today's attacker can wreak havoc uh, with a single email message disguised as a spear phishing attack. What methods should be used to address the growing number of spear phishing attacks in industrial controlled environments? So, you know, one of the things we've learned, right, uh, over the last few years, and it's continued to grow, is, is the fact that you're dealing with uh, uh, an entity or a sequence of entities uh, that will use any, any technique that's in their toolkit. So social engineering attacks, broad surface attacks tend to be inexpensive. Uh, yet they're quite profitable because you don't, you don't, gaining access only requires one point. Once I've gained access, I, you know, I become a part of that kill chain, right? So I may choose to do privilege escalation. I may choose to do reconnaissance for a considerable period of time. We've seen that with a variety of schemes in the past. Solar Winds was a great example of that. They accomplished reconnaissance for an extended period of time. Why? Because it allows them to prevail and learn a whole lot about that environment. So in order to counter that, we not just have to recognize the kill chain, but put into play techniques we all know quite well. Containment strategies like micro-segmentation allow me to prevail because I don't allow that movement to occur within my environment in the first place. So containment's a great technique. Uh, enforcing trust in role-based access, also an imperative, right? Because we know the human's going to make a mistake. It's not if your environment's going to be captured or broken into or compromised, it's when. I'm sitting down with uh, customers today or clients. We talk about the predictability or the, ra ra the rational fact of if you haven't been breached, you will be, or, or maybe you are right now. The point is we have to be ready for that by putting into play those techniques that allow us to be situationally aware and proactive in our defense. Thank you very much, Rick. The next question I think goes to David. Um, it says, risk and vulnerabilities assessments identify weaknesses in infrastructure and can provide information that complements threat intelligence gathering. How should a business prioritize risk and vulnerabilities assessments against other cyber efforts that also requires resources and funding? Okay, uh, I think all the um, uh, attack uh, handling uh, steps are uh, important, but I think that the protection uh, phase is the most uh, important one because avoiding an attack is, is uh, much uh, cheaper than the damages uh, that uh, an attack uh, can cause. So I would uh, suggest 
in my opinion, that puts 50 uh, percent uh, of the resources in the protection phase, and the other 50 uh, for the detection, incident handling, response, recovery, and all the other phases. Fantastic. Thank you, David. We have another one that uh, I think can go to you, Seth. It says, how do you recommend businesses incorporate threat hunting into existing cyber practices, and where should they start? So, yeah, I think from, from my perspective, threat hunting is always going to be something that you're going to layer on to your existing network defense program if it's not already included. And so getting started with this can actually be rather easy. You know, a, a lot of it is... Um, you know, just carving out the time for your existing network defenders to be able to uh, proactively hunt for malicious activity on your network rather than um, simply reacting to alerts. Uh, you know, I know Rick mentioned a little bit earlier the importance of this proactive defense because you know, this also provides your network defenders the opportunity to start learning uh, the skill sets surrounding threat hunting and reframing how they think about uh, pursuing adversaries rather than just this reactive defense, thinking about going out and actually proactively uh, pursuing the adversaries. And so, you know, these experiences will help guide how best to mature the program from this foundation. And, and probably a lot of what's going to come out of that is, you know, the importance of logging and data collection within the environment. I think, you know, throughout the presentation, we touched on the fact that you really, you can't hunt in data that you don't have. Um, and obviously there, there are issues and, and considerations when um, trying to gain visibility into particularly OT networks. But um, as you initiate uh, a threat hunting practice and program, uh, in order to mature that, a lot of that is going to be uh, gaining visibility across the entirety of your network, including your OT segments, um, so that you have that data and log information to be able to actually uh, conduct effective hunts and understand what is baseline, what is normal for your network. Got it. Thank you, Seth. Now, now that I have you here, I think we have time for one more question because you're talking about the topic. I think this question is very relevant. So what happened after? So how do businesses reinforce the cyber strategy after an attack? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's kind of interesting that, that after an attack, um, a lot of the same recommendations that we would have to prepare for an attack come into play, right? Um, you need to look at what went well in the incident response, right? How did your network defense teams and, and your IR plan play out? How did they cooperate and collaborate? How was the information flow, say, between your network defenders and, and then your leadership, right? It, it's almost kind of uh, a reverse tabletop exercise after the fact to say, hey, you know, we had this event, here's what went well, here's what didn't, and then figure out how you are going to improve that for, for the next potential incident, right? Because, you know, another thing that's come up a lot over the course of the panel is, is that it's not a question of uh, if you're going to be breached, it's, it's a question of when. And so I think even in you know, the post-breach or post-incident uh, scenario, it, it's still a question of not is this going to happen again, but when is it going to happen again? And, and how can we take the lessons we've learned from this experience and build them into to future response plans? Edgar, I'd love to add. Go ahead, go ahead. Just, just a little bit there. I mean, I just want to footstop what Seth, Seth was sharing there because it's really important. And I think a point of continuity in this is the adoption of a cybersecurity framework. Mm -hmm. uh, I highly recommend that because there's components within that framework that cover response and recovery. So you really tune into each of the attributes. As Seth pointed out, you know, our systems are targets of primary interest. We know that already. It's just a matter of when we have to deal with an event. And so understanding and knowing your environment really well, understanding where your highest valued assets live uh, is really important because your adversaries are going to know. And so you sort of have to behave like your adversary and be out, out maneuvering and out thinking them because absolutely they're going to be convicted in what they're trying to accomplish. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Seth and Rick. We have another set of questions, but we may have to reply to them offline just because time doesn't allow it. But thank you for the, to the audience for uh, giving all those questions, for being here uh, with us uh, in this uh, panel. Um, we hope to see you here in the other webinars of this uh, topic, of this panel discussion. We have uh, another one uh, left too. Uh, thank you, the panelists, for being here 
taking the time and share with us your thoughts and experience about uh, advanced persistent threats. And we are grateful to Rockwell because, well, for sponsoring this um, webinar, but also for working hard on the defending infrastructure and industry from cyber attacks. And finally, for globalspec.com, thank you to the millions of technical professional engineers who have allowed us to connect them to the parts and services they need for project success. And well, Katie, back to you. Thank you, Edgar. Now, just a few items before we end things today. I would like to say a huge thank you to all of the panelists today and to Edgar for leading our discussion. And a special thank you to Rockwell Automation for sponsoring the Cybersecurity for Industrial Systems Roundtable Series. Today was session three of our four-part series. Please join us for the rest of our sessions. You can visit our series page using the link listed in the resource widget. Sign up for all the sessions today. You won't want to miss it. And one last thank you to our audience members for being here with all of us today. You are going to be receiving an email from us with the link to the on-demand version of this presentation. You will be able to come back and watch it again or share it with colleagues. Again, thank you so much for taking time to attend this Global Spec Roundtable series. Take care, and we will speak with you soon.